the Water Youth Network is neither an implementation organization nor a fund, but rather an organization that encourages and enables the connection of young individuals within and beyond the water sector. We value initiative, innovation, inclusion, community, and a collaborative spirit. Our mission is to connect young professionals and students in the water sector to one another and sector partners. It also aims to empower young leaders to share and develop skills and expertise to create and advance water sector solutions. Recently, WYN has taken up the role of Global Focal Point for Sustainable Development Goal 6 within the United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth. This webinar is an effort to create awareness on SDG 6 and human rights to water and sanitation. The purpose of this webinar is also to inform young people so that they can engage in voluntary national reviews taking place in their countries in preparation for the high level political forum, which is to be scheduled in July this year and SDG 6 will be under review. We have Mr. Colin Brown as a young expert for today's webinar. Colin is a consultant in human rights currently working with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights on the mandate of the Special Reporter on Human Rights to Safe Drinking Water and Sanitation. He has obtained a Master's in Environmental Policy and he's also a member of WYN. This webinar will be for around one hour with a 30 to 35 minutes presentation by Colin. If anyone has questions, they can send those questions on chat during the webinar and Colin will respond that towards the end of his presentation. And uh, you guys have uh, written your expectations from the webinar. We will try to cover all those or in future webinars that we have. Um, if anybody has any questions, can send through chat. And I would request you all to please keep your mics, mu mics muted. Um, well, that's all for now. Colin, will you start with your presentation? Sure. Thank you for the introduction, Prapti. Um, so please let me know if everybody is seeing uh, the slides correctly. Hello? Um, yeah, we can. Okay, very good. So uh, as Prapti said, we're going to be talking today uh, about the human rights to water and sanitation. I'm going to try to keep my presentation to about a half hour, and then we would like to reserve about 20 minutes for a question and answer period. Uh, so I will get right into it. Um, the human rights to water and sanitation. They, uh, some people may know, uh, they were recognized a number of years ago, about in 2010, uh, not about precisely in 2010, by the UN General Assembly and the Human Rights Council. And that made a lot of news, but as a matter of fact, the roots of the human rights to water and sanitation go back uh, rather farther than many people were actually probably alive that are listening to this webinar. Uh, the most important uh, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in Article 25, that has been the uh, birthplace, you could say, of how the human rights to water and sanitation were derived out of the rights to life. Uh, that was made clear in the uh, second treaty that is listed on this list, the International Covenant on Economic social and cultural rights. Uh, that is really the, the birthplace, one could say, of where uh, there started to be further and further legal evolution of rights that ended up becoming uh, recognized today as the human rights to water and sanitation. What do I mean by that? I mean that um, in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, there were a, a wide range of rights that were recognized and the they did not specifically mention uh, water and sanitation. They mentioned the adequate standard of living. Uh, it said that all people had the right to an adequate standard of living and that they, uh, it also reaffirms the right to life. And in future conventions, uh, such as the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, um, then you had an explicit recognition of the human right to water. But it, it was nevertheless important, the uh, International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, because that ended up being what was cited 
in the general comment 15 of the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, uh, they cited as derivative rights the human rights to water and sanitation. So what I mean by that is they said, uh, because everyone has the rights to an adequate standard of living, uh, that means that there must be a certain number of components to that adequate standard of living. And some of the components that were uh, mentioned specifically were water and sanitation. Uh, so that general comment was created by this body, this body that creates many general comments. This was general comment 15. They've continued to create general comments. Uh, and that has given more substance to rights that were not necessarily made explicit in past legal uh, conventions or treaties, uh, but that were seen as necessary because laws are dynamic things. Laws evolve with society. They're very social, um, social elements. So it's been seen as necessary over the years to give formal recognition to rights that previously didn't have that very specific recognition. There's a, a last element on this list here, uh, this long list. I know uh, the entire presentation will not be uh, this dense. Uh, the UN General Assembly resolution in 2015, that was important because it was the first time that it gave recognition to the human rights to water and sanitation in the plural. And this was, as a matter of fact, it was even a, a subject of a little bit of confusion when the announcement was made for this webinar. Is it the singular or is it the plural? Well, since 2015, the United Nations General Assembly has recognized them as separate but integrated rights. So it's normal that we still see, because that's very recent, we still see the human right to water and sanitation being cited as if it were a singular right. But it has been recognized, uh, well, they both have been recognized as separate but integrated rights. Uh, and just pointing out here that uh, the United Nations was not necessarily, I, I mean, we talk about the United Nations and I've got to find a way to get rid of this little box here. How do I do that? Okay. Um, we talk about the United Nations General Assembly as if it were one thing, but of course it's a group of different countries. And it's important to point out that there were, it was not a completely uh, unanimous vote. Uh, the vote, the first vote to recognize the rights to water and sanitation in 2010 was a vote of 122 in favor to none against and 41 abstentions. Uh, but there were a number of absent seats as well. And that's important to take into account, I find, at a, on a political level. There are some big names on that list. And uh, we'll see that uh, it's kind of conspicuous, their uh, continuous non-recognition of uh, the rights to water and sanitation. Uh, so what I want to point out here uh, that the human rights to water and sanitation, regardless of being recognized by the United Nations, they've been recognized in national legislation as well before the human rights to water and sanitation were formally given that recognition in 2010. Uruguay is the first uh, country that put it in its constitution by amendment in 2004. And in all of these cases, uh, I think that they're on this list, which as I point out is a non-exhaustive list, uh, these were made through a constitutional amendments. Through constitutional amendments, countries have decided around the world that they want to, at a national level, guarantee the rights to water and sanitation. Most in this list are actually uh, for water. Uh, sanitation is classically kind of the, uh, the neglected right, uh, and that was part of the impetus uh, behind the separate recognition in 2015, actually, by the UN uh, General Assembly to give it separate recognition because a lot of importance is given to water, but sanitation is uh, arguably just as important. Um, so the human rights to water and sanitation has also been recognized in courts long before the recognition at the UN level. Uh, this is just one example that I've got on uh, the screen right now. And as I've pointed out, there's, there's a very key resource by a, an NGO called Waterlex, uh, which are legal specialists in water and sanitation. Uh, I really recommend that anybody uh, check out, it's a very extensive book that they've made on the human rights to water and sanitation in courts worldwide. Uh, and this is just to point out that there is jurisprudence that is dated to long before international recognition of the human rights to water and sanitation as well. Uh, which in this case, for example, uh, 
uh, is the case of a man who was unable to pay for his water services. A company tried to shut that person's water services off because the man was unable to pay for them. And a court uh, decided in Brazil that that was unlawful and that that would be uh, inhuman treatment. So that's important. What I want to emphasize with all of this is that uh, the, it's not as if uh, we were waiting for the day that the United Nations would recognize the human rights to water and sanitation before that actually happened. Uh, but it is obviously very important that it has been given more and more very explicit recognition. And, uh, and it's important that other countries that haven't uh, put the human rights to water and sanitation, given formal recognition to them in their national legislation, uh, that's an, another very important guarantee that's still missing in a lot of cases. Uh, so moving on to some definitions, uh, this is largely taken out of the general comment 15 of the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Uh, that, that document really laid down a foundation for how we can define these rights. So they're made up of uh, roughly uh, five large, uh, what they call normative content. It's not a very accessible name, but these normative content, it's uh, to say the criteria, the elements that are required to say that the human right to water and sanitation are being uh, fulfilled. So water has to be available in sufficient quantity. It has to be safe from a, a biological point of view. It has to be safe to drink. It has to be acceptable, and that means that it has to be in line with social and cultural practices of people. Some, uh, for example, indigenous peoples may have certain ways of treating water, certain ways of certain practices and traditions that uh, are associated with water, and states cannot take it upon themselves to decide what is an acceptable way of uh, providing water to any people. Uh, other people, citizens, users of water have to also have a say and water has to be delivered to them in what is considered for them an acceptable criteria. Uh, it has to be physically accessible, obviously. And what this often refers to is that water should ideally be available on premises. Uh, people should not have to walk for kilometers or for hours to go and get water. Ideally, it has to be accessible and it has to be affordable as well. Uh, for personal and domestic uses. For sanitation, you could add to that that uh, sanitation facilities uh, have to be available in a way that allows people privacy and dignity. Uh, in what I could cite as an example of a sanitation facility that maybe does not provide dignity, uh, well, that's the case of open defecation, for example. When people don't have any source of like any facility at all where they can uh, perform their needs, they have to go out and they'll often try to hide themselves uh, to do their, uh, perform their needs. And that's a situation that obviously does not uh, give much dignity to these people. They, many people feel as if uh, they may feel ashamed. They may resort to unsafe practices of trying to go out at night, trying to go out and uh, uh, very inaccessible places to try to hide themselves because they don't have anywhere that's safe where they can perform their needs with dignity. Uh, this is, of course, most essential for girls and for women. Uh, in addition to the criteria that I just spoke about, there are human rights principles, and these are common to all human rights. Uh, this isn't anything that's specific to the human rights to water and sanitation. So all rights have to be provided to people in a way that is equal, uh, that does not uh, allow any discrimination of any sort. It has to allow for participation and inclusion. And what that often refers to when we're talking about water and sanitation services is that people have to be allowed to take part in some way, shape or form in the decision-making process of how their water and sanitation sources are provided to them. Uh, this can be the case sometimes, for example, when uh, water services and sanitation services may be wanted to be privatized by certain countries, by certain cities. In some cases, there have been identified cases around the world where cities or uh, larger uh, spheres of government may take it upon themselves to take, go into negotiation with companies privately, even to, to, with the World Bank privately. They may not even publish the fact that uh, important decisions are being made for what are uh, essential services to all citizens. So 
everybody has to be able to know, uh, and this is in line with uh, active, uh, sorry, with uh, access to information. All people also have to have the right to access information on their water and sanitation services and to participate significantly in the decision-making processes. Accountability is, uh, there's a report that is coming out this year by the UN Special Rapporteur on accountability and what it means. It can be a bit of a chameleon-esque term, but uh, largely it means that people should have an access to remedy. If ever, for example, someone's water and sanitation services are cut off, they should be able to plead to their government or to that service provider and to have a just access to remedy. If ever the service provider was wrong in cutting off their service, for example, uh, there should be some sort of organ or mechanism in place that they are able to contact to, uh, and, and if the wrong has been done, then there should be remedy. And uh, finally, progressive realization means that there must, also, there must always be progress. There, there should never be allowed any uh, regression. Service, services shouldn't get worse for anybody is basically the, the meaning here. Uh, services should always get better, and they should, uh, estates should be using the most amount of their resources possible to make services better. And it's very contentious as to what is the maximum use of available resources that a state has. States have a lot of services, they have a lot of obligations, but uh, under international law, they have committed themselves to using the maximum amount of their resources to provide, among other services, water and sanitation services. What I wanna point out here is that all countries face challenges. I wanna try to give some practical examples uh, so water and like in, in ensuring the rights to water and sanitation is not something that uh, only underdeveloped or developing countries, so to say, have problems with. Uh, there are a few examples here. For example, in Flint, Michigan, there was a very important case of water contamination that was addressed by the UN Special Rapporteur on the rights to water and sanitation and other special rapporteurs as well. It was identified as a an example where the United States government had been lacking in their responsibility and their obligation to guarantee quality water for their people. Uh, this is another case in Ireland where uh, the same thing, several special rapporteurs, they called out the fact that, uh, especially in a certain city, Cork in Ireland, homeless people had no access to public services and they were de facto uh, not only homeless, not only without an adequate uh, living space, but they were also without any, uh, well, without adequate access to water and sanitation. Uh, and in France, very recently, there was a, a very well-known refugee and exiled persons case where uh, many people are amassed along the border trying to access France. They're in very precarious situations. The French government is really not allowing or they're really doing the minimum to uh, give some sort of sanitation and, and water access to these people. And that has also been addressed by UN specialists as a human rights violation. So I want to point out here that, and these are in some countries as well, like in France, in law, they have, in their own national legislation, they recognize the rights to water and sanitation. So there is definitely a difference between, and I think everybody knows this, between stuff being written down on paper and what actually uh, takes place in practice. It is a very continuous process that uh, is very dynamic, just like society. And uh, human rights law and, uh, and mechanisms should adjust themselves. They should be able to adapt to that. I wanted to address uh, the human rights to water and sanitation in the SDGs. Uh, the SDGs are coming after 15 years of the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, there has been significant uh, talk about the fact that the human rights in this day and age, uh, it was only referred to in the singular, but uh, there was a lot of talk about the fact that in the uh, documents that introduced the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, that among all of the human rights that exist and the very little mentions to human rights that were in this document, the human right to water, to safe drinking water and sanitation were the only human rights that were very specifically pointed out. And so it was no surprise that uh, contrary to the MDGs, uh, there has been an entire goal that is singled out, goal six, uh, that is on clean water and sanitation. Uh, so it's been given more and more importance. Uh, it's recognized that this is a goal that needs to be given very direct attention. Uh, 
target 6.1, it incorporates a lot of the ideas, a lot of the principles that are behind the human right to water. And target 6.2 also really reflects the principles that are behind the human right to sanitation, which I just explained earlier. So these words that are underlined, and we'll see this later, they really speak to these principles, achieving universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for all. Uh, that's a great advancement on the definition, on the target that was given in the uh, age of the MDGs. And for target 6.2, achieving access to adequate and equitable sanitation and hygiene for all and ending open defecation, that was very new and paying special attention to the needs of women and girls and those in vulnerable situations. These, uh, these were considerable advances, as I've said. And there's an interesting publication that came out by UN Water uh, two years ago, which identifies interlinkages across the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And what, I'm, what we're looking at here are what have been identified as synergies, main synergies between the target 6.1 and 6.2 and other targets throughout the agenda, which has 169 targets. So what, I, what does this mean that there are interlinkages and that there are synergies? Well, it means that very likely, and I will continue to pass while I speak, I don't intend to go through all these targets, but there are many. Uh, what this means is that in order to achieve one goal, it's very possible, it's, it's even probable that the success in achieving one target will depend on the, the success in achieving another target. Uh, that means that if the nations, if the world's national governments were capable of reaching the targets 6.1 and 6.2 to provide water and sanitation to all affordably and with special attention for women and for people in, situ in vulnerable situations, that would basically like very directly lead to further success Success and really define the ability to obtain all of these other targets. So uh, if some of you have been able to catch, I hope I haven't been moving too quickly, uh, like there are very intense ties to education, for example, the, the ability for students to have access to adequate water and sanitation in their schools is a huge determinant for them to also be successful students and to have a, an adequate education. Uh, and for women's and girls' rights as well, it's, they are the main people that sh shoulder the burden of having inadequate access to water and sanitation. Um, so I, I haven't gone in, in much detail and I don't want to into what the old MDG indicators were, but it's significant to point out that in the SDG agenda, there has been evolution. Uh, they've added uh, the entire category of hand washing. So now national governments will be, uh, they have committed to monitoring hand washing, which was not the case at all on the MDG uh, agenda. Other big things, uh, so shifting over so that you can see some of the, the actual uh, definitions of what uh, countries will try to be uh, monitoring. Now national governments are trying to identify if water is actually safe and on premises. It sounds shocking, but in the MDG agenda, uh, Water was not actually made to be tested. National governments did it when they were reporting on their success in the MDG agenda. They did not have to actually know if that water that was arriving at that borehole, for example, was safe to drink or not. It was assumed that if there were certain uh, technologies that were used, if a certain technology, for example, a borehole was an improved borehole, it was meant that there should be adequate protection that in theory, water should be safe to drink. But that was very obviously not the case. Uh, there, were, uh, there have been calculations that a very significant proportion of the water that was considered to be safe because of the uh, infrastructure that was used was actually not safe uh, at the end of the MDG period. So it's hoped that now there will be increasing attention to, is this water actually safe to drink? And that's very important because that's taking on one of the five normative content of the human rights of water. It's, it's, it's basic, it sounds crazy that it was never the case. Um, and basic hand washing, for example, is another thing that I would predict that it will become more and more a part of the human rights to water and sanitation. Uh, it's, it's, there's very clear evidence, like some, 
science and scientists have spent many like lots of tax dollars uh, proving that everybody needs like you could uh, remove the burden of disease very significantly if everybody had access to a hand washing facility with soap uh, in all places uh, in the household obviously but also in workplaces as well and uh, educational institutions um, so this is what I was talking about earlier in uh, another publication from GMP. GMP, for people that don't know, this is a, a joint institution of the WHO and UNICEF that is responsible for tracking targets 6.1 and 6.2 in the SDG agenda. So they uh, did a publication in which they tried to endorse the fact that the SDG agenda is incorporating the principles of the human rights to water and sanitation more. They, they really take it down, like what we're looking at here is uh, what the, the definition was of this target, what states said that they will commit themselves to. Because in law, people take every word very seriously. So it's important that they said, well, services will be affordable. That has very big implications. States are committing themselves by putting on paper that they will commit to people having affordable services, that they will be able to prove it. They will have to monitor how, how much are people paying for water? How can they be sure that people's water is going to be affordable to them? And for example, that services are going to have to be universally accessible to all. Uh, that, would, that really responds, for example, to one of the big concerns of the end of the MDG period. At the end of the MDG period, it was very clear that access was much greater and much, uh, much more available in urban populations than it was for rural populations. That's a very big shortcoming because there's still a very significant proportion of the world's population that live in rural settings. And it should not be uh, the case that people will de facto have to have access and accept worse services than in cities. Uh, if we were able, if national governments were able to provide uh, adequate services on an equal basis to people in rural areas, then they would really be able to influence these flows of urbanization that in many countries are, are becoming big challenges for planners. Uh, urbanization is uh, somewhat of an instop unstoppable force for many countries. And if there were, for example, water and sanitation services that were available to all to the standards of the human, human rights to water and sanitation, then we would really be able to curb some of those other dynamics. And that also has an interlinkage with other SDGs. Uh, I'm nearly done. We're nearly going to go into the question and answer phase. But uh, this is something that I mentioned before. The SDGs are also going to be looking at places of life and work. So that also means additional challenges for governments. They are now going to have to monitor and report on access to drinking water and sanitation and hand washing and menstrual hygiene management in institutional settings, which is to say uh, public health centers, in educational centers, in schools, in prisons, for example. Menstrual, health, uh, menstrual hygiene management in the last few years has really uh, gotten increasing protagonism, very rightfully so, because there are so many places, and in, in, even in many developed countries as well, where there are not adequate facilities for menstrual hygiene management. And that has very big impacts on girls and women's health. So it's very encouraging that that's being incorporated in the SDG agenda as well. And I would also say, uh, as I kind of bet earlier, I would bet that in future years, we will see menstrual hygiene management being incorporated into our definitions of the human rights to water and sanitation. At least I hope so. So here we are, uh, questions and answers. Uh, I'm going to consult the questions which I assume have been written in the chat section. If perhaps you would like to intervene, feel free. Uh, we don't have any questions on the chat. If anyone has questions, then please send it on the chat now. I'm going to take advantage to have a glass of water. <laughs> sure. Uh, so we have a question from Shivana Colin. 
Okay. Uh, she wants to know what young young people can do on this topic. Right. Um, so very good question. I think that uh, young people have uh, there's maybe two great uh, like two central kind of themes that I would emphasize on. So one is uh, that water is uh, we are all water users. So even if uh, people don't work in uh, the water sector itself, let's say uh, you may work like you may aspire to be a hydrologist and to work in a water utility, and then you have a it's very easy to see the way that you can or cannot try to impact on the way that services are provided. Uh, you could try to make sure that, uh, like you could try to influence uh, your water utilities policy, try to examine our, do we have policies uh, in place and practices in place that protect users or that are maybe harmful to some users. Uh, there are still many water utilities throughout the world that disconnect people if they can't pay. And that's not always necessarily uh, in line with the human rights to water and sanitation. If you work in a water utility or you work in government, maybe you can influence that. But if you don't, and th that will be the majority of people, then you can always try to use your awareness to bring a human rights kind of discourse, to bring awareness on human rights in general into your workplace, because most workplaces do use water, even if it's only to allow people to drink and go to the washroom. You can still be putting up signs, be uh, proposing uh, awareness activities, be trying to make sure that the, your place of work is being a responsible water user. And especially if you work in certain industries, like if you work in agriculture, then there's a lot that you can do. Like there are certain very, uh, you could say thirsty industries uh, that use water a lot. If you work in certain industries that are uh, in, in manufacturing, like very large scale uh, industries or in agriculture, then the way that you use water really has an impact on your region and maybe even your country's water availability. And if you are, like I, I would argue that many of those industries are maybe not the greatest proponents of the human rights to water and sanitation. And if we were able to influence people that work within those industries uh, to understand and to really accept uh, that the human rights to water and sanitation, they're not only a thing of law, they are a thing of, uh, of humanity, that they are, they, they kind of, they create a roadmap for us to make sure that everybody has access to these essential services that we need for, for life on earth. Uh, we can do a lot of good. So I would really hope that the youth of tomorrow, the youth of today and like the adults of tomorrow that go into any of these industries would be able to influence making us more responsible water users and uh, embracing, uh, even calling on our governments to put policy in place so that uh, human rights to water and sanitation will be rule. Um, and then, I mean, uh, otherwise, uh, we, the, the internet is uh, a phenomenon these days that it's impressive what the internet can do. Uh, we've seen social movements sprout up on the internet over uh, the most significant and insignificant things. And I think that every person, every young person could uh, take it upon themselves to try to just spread that awareness, uh, to plant seeds and, uh, and, and go around trying to plant as many seeds as possible until human rights is no longer something of, uh, of academics or of politicians, but to really make human rights a, a normal, a social, everyday thing. Um, Thanks, Colin. Uh, we have another question from Subha. He's He wants to know if we can numerically evaluate the involvement of human rights in water and environmental policies. Uh, could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, it says, uh, can we numerically evaluate the involvement of human rights in water and environmental policies? Evaluate the involvement of human rights in policy. Um, I look at policy a lot uh, in my line of work, and it can be, um, there are very straightforward ways that you can try to analyze if policy, for example, environmental and, uh, and water policy, 
there are straightforward ways that you can look and see, uh, is this policy human rights oriented? And that would be looking and seeing, do they use the words human rights? Do they use the language? The same, like as I said during the presentation, uh, my experience in law has been that uh, people are very particular about the language. Every word matters. So that's a very straightforward way. And it's arguably the best way to analyze, does a policy really truly embody uh, human rights? Because human rights, they entail obligations. And it's kind of my uh, hunch, because I don't have a very long experience in this field. But uh, from what I, I do have, it's important to know that human rights, they are obligations. Uh, when a state signs a convention or an international tr treaty and they say we recognize these human rights, that creates an obligation for those states. Many states don't necessarily uphold them on a day-to-day -day basis, but they can be called to uh, at an international scale and courts can decide, well, you have this obligation and you must uphold it. So if a policy takes on that language very clearly and says we we guarantee the rights to access safe drinking water for all people and to access sanitation for all people. That's good, but it's also very compromising because uh, it means that that state can really be held to account. So a, a more subtle way that you can analyze if policy incorporates the human rights to water and sanitation uh, means that you need to be a little more in the details. You need to see, are they using human rights language or human rights synonyms, if you will. Uh, I'll try to give an example. A lot of, uh, in, in some policies, there's a lot of emphasis on the word equity, for example. And equity, although it appeared in the SDG, um, the SDG agenda, in one of the slides that I showed here, they emphasize equitable access. But in a lot of human rights texts, they don't like to emphasize certain words. They would say like, well, we want it to be universal for all because depending on a certain nation or a certain uh, regional government's definition of what is equitable, uh, it sounds crazy, but equitable can mean different things for different people. So sometimes you will get things like that where a policy will say like, it will try to be equitable in its way of providing services. So then you, you look at the policy and you say, well, you know, it seems human rights oriented, but some language can, be, can allow for a little bit more wiggle room uh, and otherwise, you would go through criteria by criteria, like that's often what happens when we look at policy. Uh, you would look and say, well, does it guarantee that services will be affordable for people? Where is there any mention in this policy, for example, that it will be affordable? Uh, where is there any mention that this policy will allow the participation of users in decision-making processes regarding those services? And uh, regarding the environment, I, because I want to respond specifically to your question, and I'm not sure if uh, maybe I've left any gaps. Uh, I would say that at an international level, sometimes I find that there's not a lot of, uh, or maybe there's not sufficient dialogue between related um, issues. So, for example, in the case of my boss, my, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights to Safe Drinking Water and Sanitation, well, sometimes there are cases where it will be considered by the offices of the UN that his, uh, uh, his mandate may not apply directly to a certain case. For example, if there is a, in an oil spill in a river, uh, it may sound crazy, but there may be times when at a UN level, it's not, uh, it would be considered as something that would be more relevant for environmental questions, for somebody with a mandate on the protection of the environment, and not necessarily for the human rights to water and sanitation, because will that river be used for people to drink that water? Uh, is that water used and treated at a certain point in time? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But uh, for some reason, and I don't necessarily have to agree with it, separations are made. Uh, the way that water is treated at that very uh, macro level, like integrated resource, uh, like water resources management level, uh, that's seen as being somewhat separate from water supply and sanitation services for, for residents. Uh, so a lot of times you won't see in those policies, uh, very uh, like environmental policies and like very macro water policies. They may seem to lack uh, 
elements of the human rights to water and sanitation from the UN's perspective, because well, maybe it may not even aim to uh, address the same services that we're talking about. Uh, but in terms of like, how can you analyze a policy? Uh, that's, I would say that you need to be very specific about well, like, well, what words are you looking for? What, what definitions can you try to hold that policy to? Definitions do exist at a UN level of what the human rights to water and sanitation mean. There is not at a, at a UN level, the, the right to a healthy environment has not been recognized yet, but there is a UN special rapporteur on human rights and links to a healthy environment. So I would say like there is definitely interest at a UN level in that becoming a human right, but on the, it's on the behalf of some parties. I think there are other parties that I think don't want to see uh, a right to the environment appear yet, maybe. And that makes things a little complicated. So um, that's what I could say about that uh, question right now. Uh, I'm thinking I, I just wanted to address uh, one thing that I, I noticed based on the people that um, signed up for this webinar. I'm not sure uh, if there are people that are here that uh, English is not their first language, but we, uh, I'm sensitive to the fact that people may be uh, connecting in from all over the world and uh, English may not be their, their first language or their, maybe even their second language. So. Uh, we are evaluating the possibility of uh, doing this webinar in French, uh, in Spanish, perhaps even in Portuguese. Uh, so if that can be of interest to uh, maybe yourself, if you uh, found it that entertaining that you uh, needed a second shot at it, or to colleagues who may not have been able to, uh, who may have thought that this uh, webinar could be inaccessible to them because of uh, language issues, uh, that's something that I think is being uh, thought of. And I'm also uh, organizing another webinar through the Water Youth Network uh, soon, maybe next month, on communicating violations of the human rights to water and sanitation to the United Nations. Uh, this is something that can be done by nearly anybody. And I think that a lot of people don't recognize how easy it is and how exactly they would go about doing that. Uh, so I, because I know the way that this process works and I think that there uh, is required awareness uh, for everybody, especially young people that are in this sector and that want a future in this sector. I think that it would be very important and it could be interesting to know uh, a little bit more about um, how you can communicate violations and what can be considered a violation of the human rights to water and sanitation to the United Nations. And uh, specifically, I'm referring to such cases as, uh, like I mentioned, three cases at the beginning of the presentation one in the United States and in Ireland and in France. So those were cases that um, I had personal involvement with. I, I know the way that those cases evolved, how they were communicated to us. And I'd be very happy to explain how anybody could get in contact with uh, United Nations representatives. Um, I'm going to turn off the uh, uh, screen share for one second so that I can consult the, uh, the chat. Um, so I see there is a question from uh, Juanita. Which do you think are the challenges in terms of governance to accomplish water and sanitation rights? Um, that's a very good question. Um, it is important, I think, first of all, to uh, talk about what is governance. Uh, there is a lot of literature on what is governance. Um, I'm not going to go into all of that <laughs> right now because it's a very long debate, but a lot of times uh, it's important at least to point out that governance is not the same as government, right? 
Governance can be referred to oftentimes as procedures. They are mechanisms that exist. They don't necessarily need to always involve the government. Uh, it can be, for example, a water utility makes sure that there are citizens committees that also exist that are able to give their opinions and provide input to the way that water and sanitation services are provided. Uh, and that doesn't even involve government, right? But that can be considered a mechanism of governance. And I think um, what are the challenges in terms of governance to accomplish water and sanitation rights? I, I think that there are not enough of those sorts of mechanisms, like the example that I just stated. Uh, there aren't enough mechanisms that allow people to participate meaningfully on a consistent basis in the way that their water and sanitation services are provided. Um, access to information on water and sanitation services is very often not accessible to the public. And I mean that in two ways. Uh, very often, uh, it is not available at all. Uh, a citizen would have a hard time knowing where they have to go, what they have to uh, do to obtain information on their water. And that can even just be uh, having information on their water quality. Uh, sometimes that's not accessible in that sense. But in other times, it's not accessible in the sense that it's hard for people to understand. Because water and sanitation services, they're very often uh, run by people with technical backgrounds. And of course, they are very technical services. You do require people with a lot of technical knowledge. But unfortunately, the way that the, these services are provided they remain too technical. And so they aren't, uh, in this figurative sort of way, they aren't accessible to the public. It's not easy to understand. And I think that there needs a, to be a lot of efforts on the part of a lot of countries and governments to make sure that the way that these services are provided to people are accessible uh, in their language. And I mean that in a, like literally, because there are many countries where there's more than one spoken language, and that can be a barrier for some people. But I mean in, uh, in their everyday language as well. Uh, a lot of times these services are, are far too technical, and it's hard for anybody to understand even. Um, I think that those are, are rather big challenges. So like first having structures in place, some sort of mechanism so that people can actually participate and making sure that access to information is clear and available. Um, I'm seeing another question here. SDGs are volunteers for governments. Uh, what do you suggest to governments to adopt them within their regulations? What do you suggest to some governments in their regulations? Um, Soledad, could I invite you, if you have a microphone, could you elaborate on your question? Because I'm not sure that I understand it completely, but I, I do want to respond. Uh, please, yeah, you can say in Spanish. Let me try. Uh, I want to see if I can unmute you. Uh, I'm not sure that I have the ability to unmute you, uh, Soledad, but if you would like to type your question, sorry about that. Uh, and can I explain in French? Uh, Rachel, what would you like me to explain in French, the, this question? Okay. I'm going to wait and see what the question is first, and then I will try to explain. So uh, I think that the, the question that Soledad is asking is, are the SDGs um, voluntary for governments? Um, so the first question, are they voluntary for governments? They are voluntary in the sense that uh, there will be no, no direct consequence if the governments do not obtain these goals. Uh, 
Uh, they have committed to trying to do this, but there is no sort of mechanism that's incorporated into the SDGs that will, for example, penalize any country if they don't. It's just a global commitment like there have been for, for many years now where countries get together and they say, well, we will try to obtain these goals. And uh, the second question in, uh, of Soledad is, uh, can I give any suggestions for governments to adopt uh, I guess the SDGs into their national regulations. Uh, my suggestion would be that uh, going a, somewhat of a, like what I was referring to earlier, if you take like uh, concept by concept, the human rights to water and sanitation, you look at the different components that they involve. So service affordability, accessibility in all cases. One thing that I didn't, really mention, uh, but is very important for physical accessibility of services are, is accessibility for people with disabilities. Um, that's often something that may that some people may neglect. So if you, I think that uh, for national governments, they need to review their policies. Policy review is a common thing anyways. And many countries have been reviewing their policies, as a matter of fact, since the SDGs have been uh, enacted or approved. Uh, so they have been reviewing their policies and what they need to do is, first of all, on paper, try to adopt the same language, adopt the very same targets into their policies and put in place mechanisms to accomplish those goals. And the difficulty, I think, uh, one of the greatest difficulties, it's not only putting the infrastructure in place, because uh, in countries, there are many countries where there are serious infrastructural issues uh, in, in many slums that have been informally created by, with no intervention of the government whatsoever, it can be very difficult to think about how, well, how can you physically put pipes into the ground and collect everybody's sanitation and provide them all drinking water. Uh, that's one problem that's a very technical problem. Also a very social problem because you, what do you do with all of these people that live in these places? But, uh, there's also, um, there's also the, the problem of monitoring. How do you actually monitor all of these different goals? And they're in there with all of the specificities of them. Uh, if you're, for example, like service affordability, it can be difficult, I think, in an entire country to make sure that all of their services for all of these people will be affordable because how do you even define what affordable is? Uh, it, it, that's a very contentious issue, actually, and there have been reports on that, for example, of what is affordable service. Uh, some people say it should be no more than 5% or 3% of a family income, but is that enough? Uh, it, it may not be in, in many cases. So I think that the, the suggestion is really to take uh, the definitions right down to the letter and to adopt them into policy and then to create uh, the mechanisms or the institutions and the practices that need to exist to accomplish those goals. Um, so I'm being told that we need to wrap up and uh, I understand that we're almost at uh, four o'clock. Uh, there's one last slide just with my, my contact information that I would have liked to share if anybody would like to get in touch. And you know that's uh, world or with the Water Youth Network will be in touch with uh, news. We're inviting you to give your feedback on this webinar. Uh, and I hope that everybody uh, that has stuck through it until the end has found it uh, helpful. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading the comment section as well. Uh, I would also like you to uh, follow Water Youth Network's Facebook page. Uh, as I said, we will be in contact anyways, but uh, there are several pages on Facebook, on Twitter, where you can follow Water Youth Network's uh, activities and uh, attend future webinars. I'm sorry for uh, Rachel that I wasn't able to address your question in French. Uh, but as I mentioned before, uh, maybe there will be a future webinar in French uh, 
uh, and or Spanish, and I'll be happy to answer your questions on that occasion. Um, so that is it. I'm going to formally wrap up. Prapti's, uh, I think that Prapti had a technical uh, problem, so I will be uh, wrapping up for her and myself. Uh, wishing you a good afternoon, and I will see you soon, I hope.